first thought was, oh yeah, we'll do the measuring phase angle thing today. And then I came in here and I was like, oh, that means I have to have everything set up. Shoot. <laughs> Okay, but measuring phase angles. I know I've been kind of walking around the room, showing you a little bit about how that works, but figured first of all the video would be kind of nice because then you can go in and, and kind of review back and see what that really means. Make sure I'm running this. Good, it is recording. Excellent. Because it's nice to actually be able to see what that means, right? And, and, and not just talk about a phase angle. What is this phase angle thing? But visualizing it on an oscilloscope really helps you see the clarity of what do we really mean when we say phase angle difference between components, between the inductor and the resistor, between the resistor and the total, between the inductor and the total. Same could be said for capacitors. Switch this RL circuit out with an RC circuit, but I'm using the exact same components that are in that lab for the RL circuit. So everything that we measure here should pretty much be exactly the same that you're measuring in your lab as well. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and have people, um, if you've got the lab in front of you, maybe open that. Let me see if I can grab a couple here. I've graded a few and handed them back. So there's parallel RC, uh, not the parallel RL ones. Still got a few of those sitting on my desk. But, um, <clears throat> but if you've got one in front of you, go ahead and open that up so that you can use it kind of as a reference. Um, when it's saying, okay, measure across here to here. And I'll kind of be asking you the same thing so that you can see that on the screen too. So I've got our screen recorder up showing the circuit, uh, and zoom in a little bit. I love this thing. This thing's so cool. Ah, it's fun. OK, so we had a 3.3K ohm resistor. And in parallel with that, an inductor followed by a small resistor that was nothing more than a measurement, right? That's why they use the S designation, RS1, RS2. Have we ever used those in any of our calculations? Never once has RS anything shown up. What they're doing with this RS value is purely getting a voltage measurement. Why is a voltage measurement across a resistor so helpful? You because you can get current very easily. The resistor is the only thing in an AC circuit that doesn't change when you throw voltage at it. Throw voltage meaning throw alternating voltage at it. Everything else is going to change resistance. You can't just throw an inductor on an ohm meter and see what its resistance is going to be. It'll tell you the R value, but it doesn't tell you anything about how does the uh, alternating current affect that. The resistor doesn't really care what frequency you throw at it. Its resistance is just a resistance. It's color bands on it. You can, you can read those off of it. You don't even have to measure those. So we, uh, we can if we want to. In fact, I would really encourage you to throw that on an ohmmeter so that you can get an exact value. We're already dealing with really small currents, so let's get it as precise as we can. Pull it out of the board, measure it on an ohm meter. You can throw alternating voltage at it, but the nice thing is that's not going to change its resistance value at all. If we get a voltage, it's not going to change anything about the, uh, about the current going through it. Uh, there's just a little jumper wire here to keep things in nice straight lines. I like drawing it in the same pattern as it shows on the schematic. So when you see the schematic written, that's pretty much exactly what we've got here. The schematic doesn't mean we have to draw it that way or build it that way, but it's kind of nice when it does line up that way. Uh, for this one, for this little jumper wire, I literally just took some wire cutters and cut one side off of a resistor and then bent the two leads. I have no problem if you do that. Chuck the resistor in the garbage. You know, if it's a resistor that you don't use very often, like a one mega ohm or something like that, just cut the lead off, of, cut one side off of it, bend the two wires, and you have this cool little jumper wire there and keeps everything in nice straight lines. This one is simply going across two rows. Don't connect it in both in the same row. Like don't, don't take your resistor and plug it into the same row like this. Why, why not? It would be shorted. There's a wire underneath it. No current is going to go through there. So when they're saying, measure the voltage across it, what's the voltage going to be of a short? Nothing. Nothing. It's going to be zero. So that's nice. When you measure zero volts, you go, oops, did I just put that in the same row? Oh, yeah, I shorted it. Yeah, you get into that troubleshooting thing. Don't let that bother you for a long, long time. Like, ah, I'm not getting a measure. Wait, zero. That's a short. Full voltage. Oh, that's an open. You know, those two things, you should be able to you know, get more familiar with those, and those should immediately pop into your head. So these two. Um, I know this is covering it all up, but it looks like this. That's what we've got going on right there. So they're, they're still in that same pattern that it shows. In fact, I think in the schematic it shows it going back up right before it hits the source. Um, but it's in series with the source. Here's my source wire right here. Uh-oh. this freeze? Don't freeze. There it is. OK, good. Whew. Not that that's really going to change anyway. The only thing I'm going to change is where the oscilloscope leads are located in a second. Uh, I, want, I want to keep this up here to be able to show you where the oscilloscope leads are supposed to be attached, because that's probably the most confusing thing about this, is that, well, it can't connect the oscilloscope leads to an intermediate part of the circuit because it's shorting things out in the circuit. 
we got to use this math instruction thing. Uh, so that's why I'm going to leave the waveform stuff. I'm going to show you how to add the measurements, how to get the math channels in there. Uh, like I said, I've been going around showing lots of people individually, but maybe this will kind of bring it all into to clearer perspective, especially review if you've already done it. Okay, so right now I have two oscilloscopes connected, and you can see where the leads are. Channel 2 is connected here. Let me verify that. Yes, channel 2 is these two leads right here. It is connected across the last resistor in place. I wish I had also thought ahead to download the schematic for that as well. Uh, while, I'm, while I'm talking about this, while this is processing in the background, uh, I'm going to go onto Canvas and download that lab so that we can actually have the schematic there as well. Just one more thing happening in the background. It's running so much, it's getting kind of slow, so I'll just talk while this is processing and thinking. Uh, and then we have channel 1 connected up here. So this one is channel 1 also going back to ground. Ground being the exact same connection as my AC power supply. All three of these black connectors, the, the side of the power supply and both of the reference grounds for, that, for the oscilloscope measurements are all in the same place. Remember that when we're making oscilloscope measurements, we have to connect those all to the same location, and it has to be the location of ground. Uh, and depending on the device that we're using, sometimes it's not going to matter, but most oscilloscopes, their ground connection is connected to earth ground inside the machine. Now, these ones don't happen to be connected that way. They're all a USB completely isolated from earth ground. We're still going to practice proper procedures for connecting these things, because I don't want you to use a simplified version of the oscilloscope that isn't, doesn't have that ground connection. And you go, oh, that's OK. I should just be able to measure it just like a voltmeter. Now, voltmeter, does that have an earth ground connection anywhere? No, it doesn't have an earth ground connection anywhere. And here's a hint. Does it use batteries? Yeah, the voltmeter uses batteries. There is no earth ground connection anywhere in there. So you're not shorting out a component by putting the measurement leads across it. Measure AC voltage, easy. Just go across the device. With an oscilloscope, can't just go across the device because it's bypassing everything downstream from there because it puts the two grounds at the same potential, the same voltage. So if point A in your circuit and point B in your circuit have a bunch of components between them, but they are locked into the same voltage, guess what? You've just shorted out everything in between. Not going to be necessarily dangerous. Sometimes we just go, oh, shorting, it's going to blow stuff. Well, no, but it's going to throw off all of your measurements because now the circuit is ignoring every component in between those two ground leads. So you want all of your ground leads in the same place. <clears throat> okay, so that means that if I want the voltage measurement for, what are we at? Parallel RL, download here. Okay, good, that didn't disrupt things too much. Okay, so for those that don't have it sitting in front of you, second, oh, I'm just I'm abusing this poor computer. I don't know how many things I've got connected to it, but like ten. Oh, you can do it. Okay, so there's our circuit that we're dealing with. So it's uh, asking for a six volt peak to peak, five k hertz. Uh, by the way, if you don't have a 100 millihenry inductor, if you have like a 10 millihenry inductor, which we do, we, I like the 10 millihenrys because we used to have some 100 millihenrys, but they have a really high resistance in them and threw off your readings a lot. So we switched to some 10 millihenry inductors, which unfortunately is different than the number here, but they have a very low internal resistance. It's only about 20 ohms instead of like 200 that the old ones were. So like 10 times less resistance. Uh, but that means that to maintain the same voltage relationships, which means resistance relationships, if this knocks down by 10, your XL equation is frequency times inductance, right? If one of them went down by 10, the other's got to go up by 10. So we turn this into 50 k hertz. If I can change the voltage, keep the voltage, whatever it is, 6 volts peak to peak, can we get that out of a 5 volt limited function generator? Yeah. 6 volts peak to peak is how much amplitude? 3. Amplitude is your peak voltage. Peak to peak is 6. 3 volts in between, which means RMS voltage is even lower than that. Now, if they're saying get peak-to-peak -peak voltage, it would make sense if we, when making our measurements, could go into the waveforms computer and ask for the peak-to-peak -peak voltage. So we don't have to do any mental calculations of, okay, how much voltage RMS is that? I'm going to measure with my voltmeter, and it's 0.707, and it cut half. Well, if we can just ask for peak-to-peak, -peak, it's a lot easier. So let's set up measurements here. 
we're running a, uh, we're running a set of oscilloscope uh, probes right now. I want to add in a couple of voltage measurements. So that's in view measurements. Okay, the height of the wave represents what? Uh, amplitude. And that is what, voltage or time? Voltage. Height is voltage. What about the distance between horizontally? That's the time dimension. So when it says horizontal and vertical, we go, ah, if I want a voltage measurement, that's going to be the vertical side. If I want a time measurement like frequency, that's going to be the horizontal side. So let's get both of those. Defined measurement. I'm going to get channel 1's voltage. Actually, let's get the frequency first. Is the frequency going to apply to both of these? They're connected to the same circuit with only one voltage source input. So they're going to have the same frequency. I don't care whether I grab channel 1 or channel 2. So the first thing I'm going to see is frequency. When you click Add, you can move this little box over here so you can verify that it actually did add that measurement. And this one, you just kind of click Add, and you're like, oh, what happened? And then you click it again a couple more times, and you look back here. Frequency is in there like four or five times. So move this over just a little bit, and then you'll actually see it applied in there. Okay, then tell you what, let's get channel one's voltages first, and then we'll check that out. I'm going to ask for peak to peak. It says so in the lab, but also when it gives you the voltage and says, let's get a six volt peak to peak measurement. Well, okay, then let's ask for peak to peak measurements for all of our stuff. So channel one's peak to peak, add. Channel two's peak to peak, also add. And we can see which one is, look at here, channel one, C1, C2. So it actually shows us. Now, you said in the add. It's in the show. Show. Nice. OK. Hey, I like that. I love learning new stuff about this. If you find cool tips about this, please let me know. I love to learn cool stuff about the measurement tools. So yeah, that studies it out a lot. I don't know how many readings it's taking, but boy, that, yeah, that makes it a whole lot easier to read what your average is. It just samples a certain number of readings and takes an average of those. So obviously a good enough sample that we can study that out and see much better. Thank you. That's awesome. OK, so but I have two measurements that I'm taking. I'm measuring first all the way across this circuit, and I'm also measuring the end of the circuit. Okay? But if all I want to measure is this resistor right here, which go back to our schematic, that's R1. It's really the important thing in our circuit, right? When we're dealing with RL circuits, really what we had was a resistor with an inductor. These two guys, we could almost ignore these. They're only there for the sake of measurement, because really the overall big picture that we're trying to look at is an RL circuit. I want to measure the voltage on this. Well, I can't just connect my, my oscilloscope right across here, because if I connect the ground lead here and another ground lead here, they're at the same voltage, and it's now just bypassed this. Hopefully, it's not going to make that much influence in my measurements, because the RS1 and RS2 are only there to get measurements, but it is going to throw off the math. I'm going to see numbers that I did not expect to see. So. If I connect the lead, the oscilloscope lead, from here to here, uh, and then I'm going to be bypassing this one. So I connect one lead from here to here, another one from here to here. That will measure across RS1. And that also is the same place that I've connected all of my ground. So this point right here is this point right here, where you see everything connected all to that point. Okay. But then that asks the question then, the most important question is here, how do I get the voltage across this one? Well, if I have measurement of R1 and S1, and I have a voltage measurement of RS1 alone, what kind of math do you think I can do to get the R1 value? What? Subtraction. Subtract the two. I've got a big voltage that's a combination of two resistors. And I have just the second resistor. Well, if I subtract the second resistor off of it, I should get the first resistor, right? Exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask it to subtract channel 2 off of channel 1. That's by adding another channel here. And I don't have another oscilloscope channel. This isn't a four-channel oscilloscope. But I can add a math channel. Simple. Math, simple. Plus, minus, add, sub the add subtract, multiply, divide is what we call the simple equations. So if you're just asking for a simple equation on these, then C1 minus C2. Uh, I'm going to set these to similar units to be able to compare these all the same way. If you're looking at two distinct channels, you can change their scales up to make them look a little bit more visible to you. 
But if I'm trying to compare all three, see, okay, this one minus this one, I want them all to be the same scale as each other. So if I say, oh, this one's much smaller than that one, they better be at the same scale to be able to see that. If one is a tiny scale and the other is a huge scale, and we go, oh, channel two is a lot bigger voltage than channel one. No, you just had the scales completely different. So if I'm trying to compare these things literally and see how they relate to each other, if this one says one volt per div, um, these ones are both 500. Let's see if I change this one to 500. Eh, no, not good. So I better make my largest signal able to fit on the screen. Then change the others as appropriate to fit in that window. So if one volt per div is the best I can do to be able to see the yellow wave, channel one, I better switch the others to one and now I have a realistic representation of the subtraction of these two waves. Channel two, the blue wave, is it bigger than the yellow wave, channel one, or smaller? Much smaller. It's way smaller. But what about the size of the resistors? Does that also follow from our logic on resistor sizes? 3.3 thousand versus 47. I would expect this one to be very, very small in comparison to this one. Now, when I get over to measure, measuring this one and this one, what are the relative sizes here? They're equivalent. Now, this is a parallel series combination, so I'm not going to be able to say, oh, well, then the voltages are equal. Maybe not necessarily, but they're going to be a lot closer to each other. So if I have them on the same scale, I'm going to expect the blue and yellow waves to look a lot more close to each other than the yellow and blue when one of them is huge and the other is really small. Okay, And this math channel. Math, uh, I'm also going to ask for a peak-to-peak -peak voltage of the math channel because that's going to tell me the voltage of R1. Neither of these, neither channel 1 or channel 2, are my channel 1's voltage. Neither one of them actually give me channel 1. They just give me total and channel 2. None of them are R1's voltage. That's found by subtracting RC1 from channel 1 from channel 2, channel 2 off of channel 1, and then asking for the peak to peak voltage of that one. So add, defined measurement. Now my math channel shows up. Vertical, peak to peak. Add, close. Now look at what we've got here. We had channel 1, peak to peak voltage, 5.95. That's my source voltage. It's, a, it's measuring across the entire circuit. It better be the source voltage. I asked for an amplitude of, of 3, which meant peak to peak of 6, so this is doing a pretty good job of that. You can use the other function generator and just adjust it until you see channel 1, which is the whole thing, peak to peak of 6. Channel 2, peak to peak of 137, is this volts? Not quite. Not quite. Yeah, I'm going to expand this just a little bit. Yeah. Expand just enough that we can see the MV show up. OK, millivolts. 138 millivolts. Did that make sense according to what we said between the sizes of those two resistors? Now, is this going to be an exact ratio as if it was a series circuit? Well, no, it's not a series circuit. But we can at least look at this represents the bulk of the circuit. This represents a tiny fraction of the circuit. The voltages should follow along with that. But it won't be a perfect ratio because it's not a series circuit. Now I've subtracted those two. So my actual voltage across the first resistor should still be a majority of the voltage but not quite all of it. Just shy of that 5.96, we get 5.89. There's my voltage for resistor 1. VR1 has now been found. So I go back to my table, and I plug that in for my voltage drop of R1, the subtraction of total minus the last resistor. Now I want RS1's voltage, the voltage drop here, RS1. Okay. Voltage of RS1. Do I have an oscilloscope directly measuring RS1? Yeah, I do. Which channel? Two. Hey, channel two. It's already measuring it there. Great. So channel two is 142.9 millivolts. Great. That one didn't take any subtraction at all because that one, does that resistor share the same lower potential side as my voltage source? Is it directly connected to my source? And there's your key. If one of the resistors is directly connected right to your voltage source, they share a common potential point. You can measure directly across that resistor. How many resistors in my circuit are directly connected to the source? Just that one. That's the only one that I'm going to be able to find its voltage using a direct measurement. 
with an oscilloscope. All the others I'm going to have to use subtraction. That's what I had to do for R1. It's what I'm going to have to do for RS2. But RS1 shares a common connection, a common earth ground with the ground source, which is why they drew this out here to represent these all share a common ground. If you have a common ground anywhere else in your circuit, like if we connect the black lead of our oscilloscope here, there's a ground symbol here, ground symbol here, same voltage, you just bypass this. Free path around that resistor. So we've bypassed it. Oscilloscopes are notorious for that. We have to get used to this idea of oscilloscopes. All the grounds have to be in the same place because the equipment is earth grounded. If you connect those two leads in different points of your circuit, you give it an earth ground bypass, all of those components are gone. So if you tried to measure them with a voltmeter, zero. It's going to throw off all your readings. So we've got to get that in mind. We didn't have to worry about that with reading using the oscilloscope to read the DC circuits because we never use the oscilloscope to read the DC circuits because it's pointless. It needed oscilloscope to read those DC measurements. The voltmeter does a fine job of that. Now, on any one of these, could we find the peak to peak voltage using a multimeter? A voltmeter? Well, let's ask this. Can you, use the, can you find the RMS voltage using a voltmeter? Can you go from RMS voltage to peak to peak voltage? Yes, you can. It's not that hard. You multiply it by 1.4 because your peak is always higher than your RMS. So you take your RMS reading that you got off the voltmeter, multiply it by 1.414, and then double that. There's your peak to peak. But what can you not see on, an, on a voltmeter? Well, you can't see current on a oscilloscope either. You still have to calculate that. You could calculate it using a voltmeter. But you can't see the relationship between two waves. That is impossible to read when you've turned it into a flat line equivalent measurement. It's two flat line equivalent measurements. There is no difference in phases. So if the point of this is to say, what's the phase angle between these? I cannot get that with a voltmeter. It is not possible. So we have to switch to the oscilloscope and its subtraction ability to be able to see the relationship between those. Are these directly connected together? Are the, or the, both of the components pure resistances in series with each other? No, we got an RL circuit in series with a resistance. Is there going to be a little bit of phase difference between them? Was well, there a phase difference in every RL circuit that we've looked at, series or parallel? Yeah, so I have to use the oscilloscope to be able to measure those differences. If I just looked at my peak to peak voltage of this one and peak to peak voltage of this one and subtracted the two, it's not going to work because they're not reaching their peak at the same time. So I can't look at, oh, is this one three and this one's three? Oh, the difference between those must be zero. What if those threes are happening at the different times? then I can't just subtract 3 minus 3. I have to look at when is this one at its 3 volts? When is this one at its 3 volts? Look at a subtraction of every point in time. And can I do that with a voltmeter? Does that allow me to look at a wave on a voltmeter? No, only the RMS averaged out values. The oscilloscope has to be used if I want measurements in an RL or an RC circuit showing me the phase differences between them. Okay, so these are what I've got. Now I'm going to move the oscilloscope lead. I'm going to move channel one. Instead of measuring the first resistor to ground, I'm going to measure the sense resistor that comes after the inductor. I'm going to measure that with respect to ground. Okay, so I zoom this in. Oh, good. Okay, it is live. Okay, so I'm going to change this one. Instead of measuring across the whole resistance, I'm just going to measure across the sense resistor. Now, did I leave the ground clip connected to ground? Yes, I did. It's critical. Am I still going to have to use subtraction to find the voltage of this resistor? I'm going to have to because I don't have the multimeter or the, the oscilloscope connected around it. I can't because it would bypass this one. Is bypassing this one going to make huge differences in my circuit? No, not huge differences. Is it very small compared to the bulk of my circuit? Yeah, so bypassing it really isn't going to have that much influence, but it's a dangerous thing to get used to. It's a dangerous thing to say, eh, it's not that big of a deal. Shouldn't throw off the readings that much, right? What if you did this the other way around, and it was the huge resistance that was the last one you were bypassing? Now you've all of a sudden created a very, very low resistance circuit, and there's your chance of damaging stuff. If all of a sudden you've bypassed 99% of the resistance, and you're only left with 1% of your resistance that you originally had, all because you just swapped a couple of resistors. 99% of the resistance gone and only 1% of the resistance means 
a hundred times increase in your current. If you want dangerous, that's a good way to get dangerous, is increase the current by a hundred times. So now, let's see what our waves look like. Okay? Now they're small, they're chasing all over the place. What does that mean? It means the trigger level, which is what it's using to find the middle point of the wave, the trigger level can't find a voltage to use as the top, bottom, top, bottom, top, bottom, to zero in on the zero point of the wave. That's how it stabilizes the wave. It's showing you the right wave. I mean, you can see that it's still an alternating cycle, right? You can see that from here, but it's just chasing all over the place because it says, I'm looking for this voltage right here to use as the beginning and end of my wave. I can't find it. It's too small. So all I have to do is just make it bigger, right? And now it can find that middle point. I want to make it bigger anyway. It's like, I can't read anything off of this. This is a very, very useless circuit. So I use these. One volt, one volt, one volt. Let's make them smaller. 500. Ooh, that's better. It's stabilized, too. It increased just enough that now it says, oh, okay, now I can find a zero point and stabilize everything on that zero point. It's taking a whole bunch of measurements and figuring out where to put it on the screen so that you can see it more visually. Uh, still not good enough. It's still small. 200? No. 100? No. 50? No. 20? Um, eh, I'll keep it 50. Okay. Now, to make a comparison to see how do these relate to each other, I want to make them all the same. 50. Ooh, I can see now that these two resistors are pretty close in size to each other. So should they share approximately equal voltages? Yeah, we can kind of give it a ballpark estimate. It's not a series circuit, so we shouldn't say, oh, equal size should be equal resistance. It's not a series circuit, but at least now we're kind of talking two resistors that are similar sizes. Uh, but same with my math channel. Okay, note the difference between all of these. They're slightly out of phase with each other. If it's an RL or an RC circuit or an RLC circuit, do we expect things to be out of phase? Okay, the resistor is in phase with the source. The inductor, inductor's out of phase with a 90 degree voltage lags behind current. Voltage leads current in a capacitor. We expect to see those kind of phase differences. And in just a second, we're gonna walk through their process here for using this to actually tell what the phase angles are. Now this doesn't tell us current, so that means voltages relating to each other have phase angles too. When you see a current, you're gonna see the voltage at that time too. So we're gonna use voltage measurements to get the phase angle. It's gonna be related to these little differences between here, there's a little bit of time delay between this line, this line, and this line. A little bit of a time difference there. Uh, so we're going to be able to zoom in on those and really get an idea of what that time difference is. Okay, uh, so now we've got voltages here. Uh, this one's a C1 total voltage is uh, 4 volts. 50, 50, 50. Uh, it must be holding on to the old average. Much better. I guess I could have just hit reset. So reset average. All right. I guess it keeps holding an average for a very long time. I was expecting it to only keep a for a certain amount of time, but I guess it holds on to the averages for a very long time. I wonder how long it actually is. That's a lot of samples. Anyway, 198, 124, 92. Uh, I, the reason that looked a little off was because one was 4 volts and the other was like 120-something millivolts. And it's not that many times bigger than the blue channel. That's why it's important that these same range. Because if they're on different ranges, you really can't go, oh, this one looks like it's totally off. You even, you're not even looking at the same scale. You can't make assumptions about that. So we put them on the same scale to really say, do the readings I'm getting actually make sense? Does the scale size of these things actually match the numbers I'm getting? So now, total is 198, roughly 200 millivolts peak to peak. This one is 124 peak to peak meaning this one is 92 millivolts peak to peak. What do each of those represent? Channel one, what does it represent? The what? Channel one. Let me zoom in here on this guy again. Good. So channel one, here to here, okay? Two resistors. Channel two, still have not changed. That's just this resistor, okay? So the subtraction of the two is the combination of the two minus the one leaves me the other one. 
which is this sense resistor right here. So that's what my math channel, the peak-to-peak -peak voltage of my math channel, represents the voltage across this one right now. Any resistor that is not directly connected to the source, you must use math to figure out the amplitude of the voltage on that, or, or any voltage on that. We have to be able to subtract any phase differences off of things to actually see the true relationship of the voltage. Okay, So now we've got the voltages that we need. Can we calculate currents from that? What kind of currents are we going to calculate? So I got a voltage drop. I got a measured value of resistance. Easy. I equals V over R. Okay, V divided by R, V divided by R, V divided by R. Easy. Is it going to be the same current in RS2 as through the inductor? They're in series. So it's the same current. That's why they grade this one out. They said, don't measure the current. Don't, don't, measure, or don't measure the voltage. But you can compute the current because you already measured the voltage off of the resistor. They're in series with each other, so they get the same current. Now, we said current through inductor, right? Is that not IL? Just like every IL that we've been dealing with? Um, what about this one right here? Uh, sorry, this one. Which component is that? It's R1, the resistor in our parallel circuit. So if I've got the current through my resistor, is that not IR? So here's on my graph, this is IR. What about this resistor? What do I know about this resistor? Which is this one right here. It what? It has total current. Is it in series with the source? It's got to have the total current if it's in series with the source. So could I not call that IT? IT. Is that not what this relationship and therefore the hypotenuse of that line? That's what it represents. So not only can I measure what that voltage is supposed to be, I can also real quickly run my V squared or IT equals IR squared plus IL squared, that squared square root relationship, see what I should get, and then compare it to the IT to see what I actually did get. Should those numbers match? Very, very, very closely. Yes, they should. What kind of currents are those? Are those RMS currents? Are those peak currents? Are those peak-to-peak -peak currents? Peak-to-peak -peak currents. How come? We use peak-to-peak -peak voltage. So we're going to get peak-to-peak -peak current. If we used RMS voltage, we'd get RMS current. It's always easy to get RMS if you have peak or peak-to-peak, -peak, and vice versa. It's always easy to get back and forth between those. But using the oscilloscope, which means peak-to-peak, -peak, is the only way that we can identify those phase relationships in between. All right, so somebody who's got the lab open, it's going to talk. Oh, wait, I've got the lab open. Ha. Huh. Cool deal. What? Yeah, beauty of the 21st century. A projector? Blow my mind. All right, the currents. Um, current is leading and lagging. It's the computed PTP, draw the current phaser. We got all that. Now the next thing is going to ask us to measure phase angles. Okay, Measuring phase angles rather than just looking at and calculating phase angles. Yeah, anybody can plug a tan to the minus 1 of number over number and get an equals and go 120 degrees, whatever that means. I guess 90 degrees would be the most we could ever get in this. But you still kind of get this mysterious, what does that actually mean? What, what physically does that represent? We've done a lot of work with these phase angles. But let's check and see if we can actually measure these. So we're going to measure the phase angle between the generator voltage, connect the oscilloscope probes as shown in 25-3. Okay? One of them is across the source, which incidentally is the same as this point right up here, right? So. right over here. So you can see those both side by side, and I'm going to move this lead, this oscilloscope probe, back over to where I originally had it. Okay? See how it's connected to the same place as the red? There's my voltage source. Here's my other voltage source. That takes care of this one. Here's my source, the red wire. Here's the black wire. Good. What about this one? Well, I, I already had channel 2 over here. So if I already had channel 2 over here, it's, it's done. I don't need to move that at all. Okay. okay, measure the phase angles using one of the methods in experiment 24. Now, notwithstanding what experiment 24 is, let's look at phase angles. Now, in phase angles, we don't have to have the same scale because we're not worrying about voltage anymore. Phase angles have to do with time. Phase angles have to do with how much time delay is there between a full cycle 
versus the two waves. What do you call the time delay of a full cycle? And how do you calculate it? The inverse of frequency. He said period. That's the definition of the time delay between two equal points in one consecutive cycle, like the points between peak to peak, or the points at which it connects to ground here, this point, this point, this point. That's the same amount of time, no matter how, what point of this wave you're looking at. Uh, it's also the inverse of frequency. Well, if I've got 50 kHz as a frequency, how hard is that total time to find? 50 k x to minus 1. We've now found the amount of time in between two consecutive waves, which I believe was 20 microseconds. Okay, It's the nice thing about doing this lab over and over and over again. You kind of see this, the same numbers. You're like, I know what this number is already supposed to be. Okay, I'm going to turn off my math channel because I'm only trying to compare two waves together right here, not the difference between the two waves. And I'm going to get both of these to a scale that I can see. So, whoop, not one millivolt, but one volt per div. Okay, and get this one to approximately equal size. 50, what about 20? Okay, cool. Those are right about equal with each other. I like it. Now, is the blue one actually the same size as the yellow voltage? No, it's not even close. We've already made this measurement, right? In reality, the yellow is up here, the blue is like this. Barely any height at all. We just changed the scale so that we can see the side-by-side -side picture a little bit more easily. Okay, so we're going to go up in here and create some, um, some measurements. Uh, let's see, 10 microseconds. I do I like that um, in time measurements. I'm going to zoom in as close as I can so that as much of one full cycle takes up the screen so that I can still see one full cycle, but I don't have too many of them. If I cram a whole bunch of cycles in, it's going to be really hard to make a really precise measurement between two peaks. But I don't just have to count divisions. I have a way to plug in a couple of measurements. Click on this one right here, and let's select the peak of one. And then we're going to go across here and select the peak of the other one. As close as we can eyeball it. Graphs are notorious for not being perfect. They're eyeballs only. As good as you can get it, which means if we can zoom in, the further we can zoom in, the better. I might even change this instead of five microseconds per div, one microsecond per div. Do I need to see the entire cycle to be able to make that measurement? No, I could zoom in so that all I see is just the two peaks, or the two zero points, or these two zero points, or these two points. That's all I really need. Is the difference between the peaks the same as the difference between the zeros and the negative peaks and the halfway to the zero? It's all the same delay in between. So I just choose peaks because it's a real distinctive point. But zero crossings, you get the same number. This delta x. Delta x is a difference of time. Difference of time between those two peaks versus the difference of time between an entire cycle. Now, how many degrees is one entire cycle? It's a rotation. 360 degrees is one full cycle. What we're basically going to do is set up a ratio that says 2.642 is how much of 20. That should say that number of degrees is the same out of 360. Now, equal ratios say that we can set up 20 microseconds relates to 360 degrees equally to how 2.642 microseconds relates to x number of degrees, the number of degrees that we're looking for. Um, let's see if it's easier for me to just write this up here at this point, rather than setting up my projector thing. I've got a couple of minutes left. Okay. Oh, really? Come on. Okay, so I'm just setting up a couple of little fractions here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is say 360 degrees relates to, what was the time for a full 360 cycle? 20 micro, okay? 20, I'll just use U for micro. Okay, do I know how many, how many degrees this is right now, the phase angle between them? No, I'm trying to figure that out. But what was the time delay between the two? 2.6, 2.642. 2. Sure, it's precise as we want to get. doesn't really matter. In eyeballing, get as close as you want. There's U, OK? 
Six four two. I can't even. Six four two. There we go. Okay. How do I solve for x? Takes us back to algebra, right? Solve for x. Yeah. In fact, all I need to do here is just multiply both sides by this two point six four two. Gets rid of it down here. Moves it over to the other side. So get rid of it here. And up here, I say, OK? Now, that 2.642. Now, if I go to make another measurement here, choose two different things to measure. If it's IL versus IT, then I'm going to measure the other resistor, the one that's in line with the inductor. Measure that voltage versus the IT and figure that out. Is the time delay possibly going to be different? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but is the 20 microseconds going to change? Not unless I change my source frequency, because that came right from my 50. 360 degrees. Does a circle's number of degrees in a circle ever change? No, so the 360 and the 20, as long as I'm not changing my function generator, those two things stay the same, and it's only the 2.642 that changes. Okay. Uh, what, what degree do you calculate here? Somebody throws that in your calculator. What? 47.5? Okay, 47.5 degrees. Um, now, those that have, if you've already got your numbers with you, don't know if anybody does right now, but we didn't write those down when we got them unless you Unless you did and calculated the currents, this was just kind of a fly through of seeing what those numbers were. But when you do this lab, when you calculate the I, T, I, L, and I, R, a 45 degree phase angle or very close to that means that the I, L, and the I, R are almost exactly the same number. That's a 45 degree angle, right? It goes out just as much as it goes down in our graph right here. I, R is just about equal to I, L, and so our I, T almost exists at a perfect 45 degree angle. And I think that's, for those that have done that lab, that's pretty much what you got was right on a 45 degree angle. So we're verifying that, that what that means is the difference in the peaks, and we can you could voltage to inductively find current, induce to find current uh, in these parts of the circuit. That was the difference between the components that we just measured. Going back to our circuit, the components that we just measured are the resistor, the current through the resistor, and the current through total. So IR and IT is what we just found. IL and IT, those ones should be based on the difference between the, uh, the L right here and the T. Is that also going to be 90 degrees minus the 47 that we just got? Yes, because the difference between R and L is 90 degrees. So if we just found one part of that 90 degree, the other one, therefore, must be the rest of the 90 degrees. So they're going, to have you, they're going to show you how to calculate that as well. And that's in this next step. Replace RS1 with a jumper. And we're out of time right now because it's already 9.53. But they give you a diagram to show you how to do that. Now look at how we're measuring each one of them independently. Was it important to get rid of the resistor to make an accurate measurement? Because are these now directly connected to the same function generator output? Yeah, now they are because we shorted out that resistor. And in our case, that simply means take the leg of the resistor that's into the, yellow, into the red line down here and just move it up into the blue line, shorted. Easy. OK, so it's 953. Got to be done. But hopefully this provides some kind of bigger picture clarity to what we were doing with the lab. I think everybody was at least understanding a lot from the lab. But this hopefully now kind of wraps that back in and, and clears up some of the questions.